Hi, I'm indie fantasy author Melinda Cusera. Welcome to another episode of Fantasy Lore and More. And today's a really special one because I have an author here that I actually know outside of the podcast. It's not somebody that I've met for the first time. So please welcome C. Ray Dark. Come on in <laughs> to our virtual studio. <laughs> And today we're going to be talking about her book, Dreaming Beauty, which is book one of the Dreaming Princess series. So I've already got questions. <laughs> oh, you already have questions. <laughs> yeah, but we'll get to we'll get to them. So tell oh, okay. us, so tell us about Dreaming Beauty and, and about these Dreaming Princesses, because that's what my questions are. Like that, sometimes the titles just like questions spring to mind, and I'm like, oh, what's that about? <laughs> yes. So. Um... I did purposefully make the title allude to Sleeping Beauty. Um, oh, and that is my dog digging at the carpet. I'm sorry <laughs> if you heard that. Um, so, um, so it is a retelling. It is a fairy tale retelling of Sleeping Beauty. It is a series, so it is multiple of multiple fairy tales. I studied fairy tales in university or Western European fairy tales specifically at university level. And I wasn't planning to do fairy tale retellings when I was learning about them, but um, I started getting into it with um, my second book of my haunted romance trilogy. And I had way too much fun with it, researching all of the different um, variations of fairy tales, specifically going into Grimm's fairy tales for um, that story. But then for the Dreaming Princesses series, I was having fun with the theme of how many princesses or um, just maidens are fall asleep and <laughs> you are put to sleep in some variation or another in fairy tales. And I've always been fascinated with dreams and just the bizarreness and kind of almost inspiration of them. And so I mostly came up with this story thinking, well, Sleeping Beauty was asleep for a hundred years. What did really? she dream about? Yes. In Charles, most versions, she was asleep for a hundred years. Disney cut it short so that she actually, she could meet her husband or her Prince Charming before yeah. she was put to sleep. Um, Disney made a few changes. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 and I've heard that they changed other fairy tales. Oh yeah. yeah. Oh yeah. Um, uh, oh yeah, <laughs> I could get into Princess and the Frog. Um, the, the that's my book two of this series is Fairest and the Frog. So that one um, is uh, Snow White, so Fairest, and then also Princess and the Frog. Um, so it's two different princesses and their retellings. Um, and that's book two. I'm getting ahead of myself already. And <laughs> Before we go back to that, like, what is it yes. like to study like fairy tales, like in a, an academic setting? Because like when you said that, I was like, what, what is that like? Like, what do you like? Do you like? Yeah. What is that like? Like, what, how does that work? What do you do? I'm, I'm just I'm just curious <laughs> before we get to <laughs> no, the book. That's, totally that's an fine. interesting background. Yes. Yeah, so I actually have my um Call university textbooks um, just on my shelf right next to me. Um, just next, I have so the classic fairy tales from Iona and Peter Opie, and it's just a collection of fairy tales. Some of the histories that they came from, um, some of the you know inspirations and other tales that are similar to them, and then I also have the classic fairy tales from. Um, so it's in the Norton Critical Edition, edited by Mar Maria Tarter. So it's a bunch. It's more fairy tales than what was meant in the first book. And then it's also, or different variations, um, but it's also including um, some modern research and different takes on the different tales. Mm -hmm. So like with Hansel and Gretel, you get the fun issue about the inspiration of Hansel and Gretel being, uh, or sorry, not Hansel and Gretel, the Pied Piper being, there was actually a town in Germany where a hundred kids just instant just disappeared or you know they and there are theories of whether they it, there was some kind of sickness but why was it only the kids there were some theories say that the city was so poor that they sold their children to colonists and let them, so the pied piper is kind of like a you know it's the fairy tale that makes that it 
explains or gives a reason to what happened. And so there is so much history that can be discovered and picked apart from variations of different fairy tales. Like um, there's a Cinderella, especially since it's so old, it dates back to Roman times. Of, but then there's also you know a Chinese version where um, her, the fairy godmother's a goldfish, and <laughs> that's so fun. <laughs> so there's so much you can learn about history just from studying fairy tales, not just the um, you know the classic moral stories that you can get from them, um, and then just the fun you know. Like my textbooks were only 200 pages. They weren't these massive things you know, that were outdated in five years, like medical textbooks. <laughs> and so I loved it. Um, my end of the year pro um, uh, uh, thesis, or well, okay, kind of thesis, capstone paper was 25 pages long, just talking about Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> oh, wow. Actually. So but, I loved was it, it. It was fun. Was it one class or was it yes. like a whole degree program? It was just one class. It was just my capstone class for um, my bachelor's um, at Brigham Young University. And so, because anyway, I had already studied Shakespeare, I had done a class on that. And so there was an option to do another class specifically on Shakespeare for the capstone. And I thought, I want to go see something different. I want to see, you know, explore something different. And um yes yeah, <laughs> way too much fun <laughs> ending up um yeah comparing disney to shakespeare and the grims of like yes he took stories and he changed them but or and you know a lot of people actually criticize disney because he changed the stories but um i i wrote this whole paper <laughs> defending <laughs> disney thinking yes he did but he did it so that it would be appropriate to the audiences, just like Shakespeare did, just like Charles Perrault did. Of he takes these classic stories that were told out in the fields with the shepherds, and or you know just among the people as they're spinning their wheels, and he made it popular. <laughs> and I'm not going to argue with a story made popular, <laughs> <laughs> or just a story made to be more appropriate to its audience. And, you know, because that's what we do as, as fairy tale retellers, just in re general of, you know, novelists, we are retelling the story in a way that we want to hear the story told. And, you know, so I'm, yeah, I, I, I love fairy tales. I don't bash on Disney for it. <laughs> no, and that's cool. So let's, so let's go back to your, uh, your version of Sleeping Beauty. How did you, like, after researching and writing a 25-page paper on it, how did you settle on, like, like what sources you were going to draw from? Did you, did you just write your own version? Or did you, like, piece together different versions? Like, you liked this from this and that from that and, and just braided that all together? Like, yeah, let, I'm curious. <laughs> how does that work? <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I did that more so with um, Princess, or sorry, uh, yes, Princess of the Frog, because that one is a little older, but with Dreaming Beauty specifically, or Sleeping Beauty, I did specifically pull from Charles Perrault's um, Sleeping Beauty, because Disney and Grimm's only told half the story. Oh! Uh, yes, they're, the kiss at the, at the end of Disney, that's only half the story they wake up and there's an entire venture afterwards. And I, oh, I didn't know about that. Yeah. Most people don't, which is why I wrote dreaming beauty to explore that a little bit more. And also to make people more aware of it, because that was the one story that actually irked me of like, come on, there was so much adventure that goes on afterwards. Um, What's left but, for them to do afterwards? Like, cause I, I remember the Disney version. I saw when I was, was, pretty young yeah and they you know he wakes her up and th then they fight the witch the <laughs> person who put her under the spell mm -hmm. there's a whole thing with the, him stabbing the dragon with a sword that's yes then my memory gets super fuzzy <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's that's pretty much the ending and that's pretty much what most people know about it <laughs> same with yeah princess and the rock oh my goodness i'm sorry there's like a whole thing on that but um and it depends on which story you're going with. Um, but for at least 
Charles Perrault's version and um, I think it's Basile's version. I'm trying to look at my notes really quickly and still say no, on it's okay. Of, <laughs> and were, um, were they pulling from like were there actual stories out there or did they like make this this up? Like um, where did they get this additional adventure after? <laughs> so I don't know all of the versions. No, no, um, that's fine. But the oldest one I'm aware of is from the Valen Saga Saga, Saga, which is um, Brynhild was banished to Earth uh, and forced to wed, but her biggest fear was to marry a coward. So Odin put her in a deserted castle surrounded by flames, then touched her with a thorn of sleep to preserve her. Mm. Then a man, Sigurd, um, removed her armor. He would instantly fall in love with her and she would wake. So no kissing involved. He just removed her armor and she would wake up. And the kiss actually didn't come until about 1800s. So well, I can see why they, they changed the remove the armor for mm -hmm. kissing. The kiss yes. is a little more chaste for those times. Oh, oh you don't even know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I was like, so I can see I can, like how much, you know, how much armor was removed. <laughs> was she wearing anything afterward underneath I mean, that? We'd hope that some like how desperate really was she? Comfortable. She's wearing something <laughs> underneath it. But <laughs> I mean, it could have been like, you know, very sheer. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, I, I mean, how adult is your audience? Um, <laughs> Because they're, they're all adults. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, Pentamarone, uh, Basile's version, which is actually the one with the most, or well, okay, Disney pulled from Grimm's and um, Pentamarone, and or well, Basile. So in Basile, <laughs> <it's>, um, <laughs> oh goodness, okay. So she flicks her, yeah. It, goes to sleep from a splinter from spinning flax. Um, that whole thing is the same, but um, then, you know, she's falling asleep. New King comes around by the time he's, er, and he's hunting, his falcon flies into the window of the castle where she's asleep and has been abandoned. Um, the King goes inside, goes in, inside finds um, Talia is her name, um, does things without her consent and then Ooh. leaves. Talia has twins, she's still asleep. But she has she... twins. Okay. How does that work? <laughs> and a girl named Sun and Moon or Jor and Aurora. But who names them and raised them if she's still asleep? She's raised by their kids are raised by fairies. Uh, you see the similarities with Disney? Yeah. She Aurora is knit raised by fairies <laughs> and sucks out the and sucks the splinter out of her finger to wake up sleeping beauty. Because they and, want a parent. <laughs> yes. So soon after the king returns and they bond, but he's actually married to an ogress. And <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, you, you see how. <laughs> wow. Um, yeah. So by a trick, the ogress obtains the twins and puts them there and gives them to the cook saying, hey, cook these up and um, and then feeds it to the, the king. The cook actually kills two goats, two kid goats and serves that to the king. But the queen doesn't know that the king doesn't know that he thinks he ate his kids. Um, <laughs> <laughs> What? And wow. that sleeping beauty is also you know ordered to be eaten but um yeah she is she plays for time taking saying oh but my clothes are so fine you don't want to you know ruin these and so she undresses to slowly play for time and that's until her husband or the king comes back and um or well yeah her the king comes back and catches the ogress trying to eat her so yeah um that's basile's version of sleep. wow <laughs> and so but yes i preferred charles perot's version because it's still um ollie the the knight prince um the prince actually he comes he just falls at his knees at her bedside and Aww. that's what he wakes up i'm like oh that's sweet that is sweet and then they have some wild adventure <laughs> And then they have some wild adventures because there is still the ogress going on. Um, they're just not married. She's the mother-in-law. And so, or yeah, the prince's stepmom, wicked stepmothers, fairy tales. <laughs> yeah, there was a definite, 
the fairy tale writers definitely had a beef with their mother in law. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of like mother in law and stepsister yes, like yeah, hate going on yeah. there. <laughs> there's some not very happy families. <laughs> Yeah, so I based it more on Charles Perrault's There is a kiss because I'm writing for modern audiences and it's YA though, so it is Disney clean. Wait, wait. And, it, it, yeah. if she was asleep for 100 years though, is it still YA? Because she's like technically not a teen anymore. <laughs> is it like Robin the Cradle? <laughs> uh, it, it, so that is one common theme though in all of the Sleeping Beauties that no matter how long she's asleep, whether it's um, it's usually an undetermined determined time or a um, hundred years specifically that she is always preserved just like Snow White. Um, so I, some kind of magic is involved. I see. There. I see. Yeah. <laughs> so she's not pulling what is it an edward cullen is that the, the yeah, twilight no, thing <laughs> no. i do want a snow white vampire though i want that story <laughs> somebody write this that could be fun <laughs> and i think someone else encouraged um a or yeah i have like this whole list of undead princesses that would be you a should totally do it <laughs> you should totally do it like i could see snow white as a vampire like that would explain why she's so pale <laughs> you know and the red lips <laughs> and yeah and why she doesn't like, eat the apple vampires blood. only drink and, blood <laughs> and her beauty of like she's a vampire <laughs> We're totally so off topic. Nice. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, we're still on topic. We're talking about fairy tales and fairy tale retelling. So we're very much on topic. <laughs> okay. Okay. As long as the moderator says so. <laughs> I'm the host and I say we're on topic. So we I'm are. <laughs> so, so let's, let's bring it back to Dreaming Beauty, your book. Okay. So, okay. So you're using the, the pro ones, but we've still got the ogre but that's the mother-in-law <laughs> and so I, obviously there's no kids to be eaten because he just you know yeah he didn't do anything to sleeping <laughs> while she was asleep yes. very respectful gentleman we we applaud that <laughs> yes yeah my my books are for ya they i actually my eight-year-old nieces have even read them so they are um tame but yeah, there's still some fun battle scenes like actually book three i just um is with some beta readers right now and um they're really they're co making lots of fun comments about the battle scenes so i have fun that's with my, cool. my sword fights and <laughs> no that's very cool i'm not great at writing action sequences i try but like i'm much better at like magic and crazy uh -huh. things but so i i'm i applaud people who can do the the fight scenes because uh -huh. I, I just my brain just kind of turns off just a picture <laughs> i can't i know there needs to be some kind of violence here but like i can't see it i don't can't can't describe what you can't see so. well i'm a very visual person also which is actually why i based a lot of um the book off of my own personal experiences as um okay <laughs> going back to talking about the story, I guess, of what it's actually about. Wait, wait, so wait, wait, you were, were you about to talk about your mysterious sword fighting background? <laughs> like an alter ego that like, like Zoro style crime fights with the sword. I mean, we do have a nice little collection of um, newsletter openers, or sorry, not newsletter. <laughs> oh, they're um, all swords. That's yes, so fun. Um, mail letters yes yeah it's sword shaped letter openers like, yes. those are fun <laughs> we have a couple of them and we have fun it's, it makes opening the mail much more adventurous yeah <laughs> i don't have one i'm gonna have to get one because that that looks like fun oh well, they're um, much cheaper than real swords yeah, I, I kind of want like one of the Lord of the Rings ones now, so I can yes. I can channel Aragorn as I open letters, <laughs> as I open bills, I can yes. slash them to pieces. <laughs> so yes, the one we have uh, Excalibur replica, a um, Robin Hood, and a which Robin set. Hood? Because there's um, like multiple versions. <laughs> this That's one's another... supposed to be Robin Hoods. I see. Because there was yeah. like multiple like retellings. Like I, yeah. I, 
If there's multiple it's all fantasy swords anyway, so it's whatever people make it to look, you know, pretend yeah. it to be, which I'm okay with because it just looks pretty. <laughs> hey, that's what matters. You want pretty swords so you can mm -hmm. open letters with. And then so yeah, all right, so let's go back to dreaming. Stuff. Anyway, now we're yeah. really off topic. <laughs> so okay, so uh, before we go back to dreaming princess, well, we're still kind of on topic because fantasy swords. I mean, we're oh, still in the fights. realm. Yeah. So um, who doesn't? I'm not great at writing them, but I love reading them. <laughs> so, uh, so the dreaming princesses are each book like a, is it like a series of standalones, or are they just are they connected by the fact that they're all fairy tales, or are there characters that cross between? It is very much a continuous story. Um, ah, yes. Yeah, so the first book is primarily about the um, emerald, or Emmer is her nickname, um, and she is the representation for Sleeping Beauty. Sorry. Um, and her sister. And so she has um, in the, sorry, there's so much around this. <laughs> there are actually 12 dreaming princesses. Um, oh. Yes, because that's how many stories I found. And I also wanted to play with the 12 are dancing princesses. Are they all sisters? Princesses. They are not all sisters, even though they are in the 12 dancing princesses. I just didn't know how, I, I wanted to keep them in teenage range without having triplets and quadruplets. And so, <laughs> yeah, that um, could get a little crazy. Yes. <laughs> and so I did create three different kingdoms in the Regina Valley. Um, so there's the Somnus kingdom, which is where Emmer is from. And that's the Northern kingdom. And it's kind of, um, uh, so it's, and it's all kind of medieval. Mm -hmm. time period and it's all surrounded around a lake i could show for the viewers i can show the map um because well okay and it's it's just half of the map but whoop, let's see if you can see that whoop, there's a there's a it's really blurry i'm sorry <laughs> yeah, so maybe you could talk us through it yes so emmer and her four sisters so there are five of them are from somnus and um then they're and each of them will have their own story. Each of them will have their own retelling. Um, so one of her sisters is Snow White, or representation for Snow White. And she, um, you get her story, or two of her sister's stories in the next book, which is Ferris and the Frog. So Snow White and Princess and the Frog. Um, and Marin is one of her older sisters. She is the princess with the frog. And since that one has so many messed up things, I, ma I made her married to make her story chaste. Um, because <laughs> <laughs> there's a reason Disney went the way it did. <laughs> so <laughs> the originals were very X-rated. <laughs> Not exactly X, just um, uh, questionable. Um, and it was like, it was very much, she slept with the frog for three days uh, in most cases, or she chopped off his head um, to turn him back into a prince. Um, and don't how ask do me you... how that works, but- Yeah, yeah. like, yep. I mean, was he small, like a, a normal frog or was he like yeah, extra just a little frog, large? And she would either chop off his head or sleep with him for three days. Or um, the version I preferred though, and the one that I used is she actually had to travel to the well of the world at the world's end, which is more basic to the Scottish tale, um, which is where it actually originated. And um, so back to Dreaming Beauty, sorry. <laughs> um, she, uh, so each princess has this backstory of this um, kingdom. They're all from the Regina Valley. And I'm totally scattered on this, I'm sorry. No, it's okay. But they get together. Um, during these masquerade balls at midnight on the, an island that was in the middle of all of them. And so that's where the dr uh, dancing princesses stories comes in. You have the 12 dancing princesses who all snuck away in the middle of the night to go to these mas to these balls. And it was this huge question of how, why are their shoes all ruined? Why are these 12 princesses all, you know, all their shoes are ruined every day. And, there's this huge mystery of how do we find their, you know, why are their shoes, shoes ruined? Because apparently shoes were a big mystery back then. <laughs> <laughs> but um, 
so that is like their backstory for each of these princesses. They all met together. They're all friends. They, um, even though their parents don't know it. And <laughs> um, then each of them is tricked or poisoned and it falls into this dreaming state where they dream of our modern world. And so we have this, especially in book one, you have this fun um, culture clashing, paradigm shifting, medieval princess going around contemporary England thinking, what on earth is a smartphone? What is this magic? <laughs> and why does everyone have it? And she comes into some of her own magic and she does some fun things trying to wake herself up <laughs> and explores the beauties and marvels of England because um, for those who are watching the other side, I, I'm obsessed with England. <laughs> and I went there for a study abroad, so I lived there for seven weeks and then went there again with my husband for another two weeks. I studied there too. Where did oh, you study? Really? Yes, I studied in London. I lived in uh, um, Palace Gate Terrace, I think. Oh, uh, okay. in, um, was that part of town? Like we were like in the really rich area of town. Yeah. That's just where the yeah, dorm we was. <laughs> We were a block away, from, or like literally down the street from uh, Hyde Park. So yes, absolutely gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> which 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 university did you study at? It was with Brigham Young University, but they did also have um, people with from other schools um, from Utah as well. And so, um, like we had a couple from Utah University and a couple from um, uni University of. Oh, oh so changed. they had like a satellite campus in the UK. Not exactly. It was it was a center and there were about 40 of us. Um, and we were there studying about um, the history and politics and the literature of England. And so we went all around. We went to Stonehenge. We went to Dover. <laughs> we went to Land's <laughs> End. And Lake, have you been to the Lake District? I don't know. I don't know if I did get there. I did go to Scotland and oh, I yeah. did go to, I did get to see quite a few bit places in Europe. I went to the American International, uh, American International, it was, it was, there was an American International School in London and that's mm -hmm. where I went because my university, Pace University uh, in New York, had a relationship with them and they didn't have their own study abroad program. So that American Institute was part of something called, I, I don't remember how, what the acronym stands for, but it was AIFS. And okay. so through that, there, through that program, I was able to go and study there. So I lived in London from like, the, like January 8th of 2020 one no 20 of 2001 until oh, may okay. 15th ish i want to say 20 uh 2001 um but before the like five months yes i, I was oh. there the whole school year i, oh, I actually i did the whole semester <laughs> i had british teachers oh, my, my classes God. were full of international students because mm -hmm. um the whole point was to to be an international student and live there so like everybody was from everywhere so that was really cool there were some british students too mm -hmm. but um a lot of, but most of my classmates were from all over the place which is fun um that would be such a fun experience yeah i took i took five classes while i was there one was shakespeare we went to see like a five different shakespeare plays as part of the class Ooh. um and yeah i did a full semester <laughs> uh and um, I'm trying to think of what else we did before class started. There was a two week tour of Europe. So I went on that and we flew into Schiphol airport in Amsterdam and we were in Amsterdam for a few days. And then we went, we drove to Belgium. There's about 50 of us on that trip. And then we went, we went around Belgium and then we went to Paris. We drove through France to Paris. We roamed around there. We went to Versailles and then we eventually like took the, we took the ferry from Calais to Dover and then we drove from Dover to London. So that was neat. That was two weeks. Mm -hmm. And then I started class after that. Um, that was, it was, it was, oh, it was a fun, it was, it was definitely fun. It was also kind of lonely because I didn't yeah. know anybody and um, at all. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. a little challenging to make friends when you're like studying abroad and like everybody is studying abroad. 
Um, but like, um, I, I was the only person from my college who went, but there were other colleges because George Washington University also didn't have a study abroad program. So there was like a ton of people from there who were uh, on the thing and they all knew each other. So there was a lot of clicks. Mm, yeah. yeah. It was very lonely too, because I didn't know anybody. Yeah, I didn't <laughs> I know anyone online friends. when I went, but uh, there was like for some reason, half of our group, or at least a good chunk of it, like maybe at least a third was, they were all dance majors. And I'm like, what are you doing here? Uh, <laughs> that's crazy. Because they were complaining about the homework. I'm like, it's a study abroad. <laughs> like, yeah, like they thought it was a dance abroad. <laughs> I, I don't, they just wanted a vacation pretty much. And, <laughs> but I made some really good friends on that during that those seven months or those seven weeks i wish it was seven months no. <laughs> and um it's very expensive if you'd stayed longer <laughs> they go yes, for five yes. months and like trying to you know it's yeah. very expensive <laughs> well and we were actually i was actually there for that during that time that was during the 2012 olympics oh. so the london olympics um and so yeah the flights were pretty over well, almost half the cost because <laughs> It was during that high season time. And oh, wow. Um, and I was there just after the dot com bubble burst. Uh, <laughs> when and like and and like where, where everybody's like, you know, did Y2K like that's still that's not a thing still? <laughs> like, that was still something people were talking about that. And I was like, dude, like it's over. <laughs> you know, it's been a year. It's good, you know. Yeah. You don't have to party like it's 1999 anymore. <laughs> but there were still people in that mindset. <laughs> It's just wild. The yeah. Difference. And we got to watch a, or we went to a pub during one of the, um, it was for, uh, Italy versus England um, football, you know, a football game. And Italy won. And, oh. so, <laughs> no. and because it's London, you have one portion of the pub that's all English. And then the other portion of the pub that's all Italian you know, just in London. <laughs> and so, yeah. When I was in London, we, we avoided was, the pubs on football was, night because there was just, <laughs> you just could not win. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, we left as soon as the beer started flying. <laughs> yeah. That's what my friends, that's what, that's what I used to do. Cause you could get cheap, you could get really like inexpensive food at some of the pubs mm -hmm. and like, it was cheaper than the cafeteria at the yeah. college. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that and like sometimes Starbucks would have like some things. So that was like all I lived on in the $5 prawn chow mein from the takeaway around the street. Yeah. <laughs> that was my whole like, that was it. <laughs> Everything else was just too expensive. Even McDonald's was like expensive. <laughs> we went there once and I was like, yeah, no. Where's that prawn chow mein? Where's that place that had prawn chow mein for five pounds? <laughs> I went to McDonald's just once just to get the uh, they had some Starburst flavored shake or something like that. Something or in a deep fried um, apple. Yeah. Um, things you don't have in America in the, in the U.S. Um, McDonald's. And I'm like, okay, okay, I'm going to McDonald's to like... just for those. I don't care yeah. about the burgers. I've had those. <laughs> yeah, we were up by uh, the um, what's that thing? The where the prime meridian goes through i forgot what that's called oh yeah yeah um, there's a mcdonald's over there and mm -hmm. walked in and like the price i was like i got like sticker shock i was like oh my god this is as much as a nice dinner out like oh. no i am not paying this for mcdonald's <laughs> i will wait until i go home for that <laughs> where it is like there which it was like tw three times more expensive than it than it was back home and i was like forget it like mm. i don't i mean i'm used to paying new york prices but this is ridiculous <laughs> and the exchange rate was really uh because i was there before the euro and all that and the exchange mm. the, the u.s dollar was not worth very many pounds at that point. <laughs> like when we were yeah. when we were out in france and italy and all that the u.s dollar was worth a lot because there was no euro yet <laughs> So we were you were we were living the high life then, but in 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 London it was like, okay, <laughs> I have ten pounds, but the ten pounds is really more like twenty five American dollars. <laughs> I need to be careful with this. Yeah, when I was there, the exchange rate was closer to like ten dollars to fifteen, or sorry, uh, fifteen dollars to ten pounds ish, I think. Yeah, because yeah, so everything maybe, actually maybe seemed like it was cheaper. Yeah. But when I did the 
exchange in my mind. I'm like, okay, it's actually normal, like similar prices. But sorry, we have totally. Yeah, oh, we, 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 <laughs> sorry, we, we got off on the London <laughs> connection. Um, but yeah, let's, like, let's because get, I love let's... England so much yeah. and I can talk forever about England, I wrote this book, these books where I could take my characters, you know, this yeah, medieval princess going to, um, you know, she wakes up in Bow Castle. Of which is where Tintagel, you know, close to Tintagel, um, and, you know, the Camelot area. And so I just absolutely loved that, that area, just beautiful views. And so she wakes up on one of my favorite areas over there. And again, because I'm a very visual person, I relied on my own photographs that I took from that, those areas. And, um, and then she gets to go to, um, oh, so she just there. roams around like like England have living her best life in confusion. Not exactly. Because so she's this... trying to do things to wake herself up. So she goes I specifically see. to St. Michael's Mount um, just off of Penzance because that uh, that castle and that little island look is very fairy tale um, heavy. It, you know, they have um, they have a well that they, I think it's called the giant's well there. And they have, um, it like, um, they have little postmarks almost of like, this is where Jack and the Bean happened. Like almost <laughs> to say, these are where fairy tale things happened. And the castle itself is very fairy tale esque. And, um, some of the plants are, they look like they came from a Dr. Swayze book. <laughs> I was just like, what? Oh, wow. oh, like they were just so bizarre, and I had never seen plants like them before. And you know, it was just very fantastical and very inspiring that I had her go there to um, not only you know share this experience, but to um, that's where she think you know her um, her guides think that she might wake up because that's a fairy tale esque place. Same with Merlin's castle. And, um, you know, with every, all the legends and lore that surround the Arthurian court, and then also going to Stonehenge, where there are so many legends and just different ideas and concepts and theories about Stonehenge, where it came from, how it got built and what it mm. was meant for. And so she goes to these places specifically to because her guides think this is these are the places that will help her wake up because they're magical just even in our own world mm -hmm. and but of course she goes also to london because i that's where my heart still lives <laughs> and um and that's where the her guides are from and so or live and so they they can they run out of time basically and have to go back home <laughs> and they take her with them. <laughs> but, um, I don't, I, I don't know if there's time for the expert. No, yeah, no, let's, let's get to that. that. Let, let's hear, let's hear Emma in her own words. Yeah. Is, whoop. Do you want me to show the, um, the book cover? Can talk about yeah. The book cover? It's a pretty one. So it's green. Yeah. And there's a spinning wheel and it says dreaming beauty. <laughs> it's got some thorns and flowers on it. Um, so, and I'll just read chapter one because sure. that introduces the character plot or characters and plots. I think I like the best and please excuse my voice. There's a reason I don't narrate my own books. <laughs> <laughs> You'll be fine. <laughs> okay. Chapter one. I never liked needles. Whether sewing, knitting, mending, or embroidering, I disliked the frustration of stabbing the thread through the eye, the tediousness of weaving back and forth, and the piercing pain of accidental pricks. All the same, I never expected a single prick to, from a spindle to be my demise. Everything was supposed to be perfect for my 16th birthday celebration. I had planned the ball and feast down to the napkin folds. From the truffle appetizers to the elaborate fish entrees, from the spring green drapery to the flor star floral arrangements, and from the dance-worthy music selection to the hour candles to keep it the schedule, I organized it all. This event would prove to my father that I could lead, that I could see projects fulfilled, and that I could be like my eldest sister, Garnet. 
Garnet and I were physical opposites, making my dreams to be like her almost silly. At 20 year old, years old, she was a female version of father, the king of Somnus, with, his ink, with her ink black hair, strong and sharp facial features, yet motherly figure, a mouth that seemed most comfortable in a cunning smile, and, a dark, and dark brown eyes that could take on the world with all of its challenges and worries. I, however, took after mother with my round face, sandy blonde hair, emerald green eyes to inspire my name, and features that required emphasis to call them feminine. Garnet stared suspicious eyes at me, the perfect image of frustration if she wore a frown instead of a teasing smile. Emmer, she said, how can you expect to help? How can you expect me to help you if you lock me out of the ballroom? I responded with my cheesiest grin. Your persistence to help me is precisely why I barred your entrance to the ballroom. Your schedule is busy enough as it is. I expect nothing more of you than to enjoy the celebrations tonight. Garnet's smile twitched as her eyebrows went high. Do you realize how backwards this is? Most people wish to be surprised on their birthdays with the festival that was planned for them, not to be the one frantically planning a surprise event for others. I know, I said. But what I want for my birthday is to see you and the others enjoying yourselves. Garnet pinched her lips tightly and her tired eyes growing sad. Her tired eyes growing sad. I suppose I will try. Very well. You have full responsibility for, of this event. Perfect, I grinned. Garnet's joy was my short-term goal for the night. Long-term, proving myself worthy to lead and let Garnet and Father give me more responsibilities. Then I could lighten the burdens on Garnet. She was perfect for someone who was born and bred to someday rule over someness, but she was imperfect for someone who had to make hard decisions. She was a per I was a personal witness to her love and concerns for our people. I was also a personal witness to her anxiety attacks before festivals and after battle reports. The only times I saw my eldest sister truly happy were during our secret midnight masquerades. With that in mind, I had planned a masquerade for my birthday a celebration. Garnet sighed in resignation and turned to leave. I watched and waited for her to draping red gown with golden embroidery to disappear around the corridor. Finally, I ran to the kitchens. The chaos inside and mimicked my insides as every chef and baker bustled about calling orders and services to one another. The heated room smelled of flour, fish, and spices. I skipped around the preparation tables, careful not to dirty my d dress or shoes. My older sister, my other older sister, entered from the castle side entrance. Aquamarine, known as Marin among my friends and family, had father's black hair and mother's rounded face that made her look younger than her 18 years, and her eyes were a green and brown mixture of hazel. She wore her usual outfit for visiting her husband at the docks, a simple surcoat over a tight white shirt. The surcoat had wide armholes for easy movement and was made elegant by its bright pink blue color, pink flower embroidery, and a pink sash knotted around her waist. Ah, oh, there you are, Emmer, she said, gesturing for people behind her to come forward. Her husband, Admiral Rene Irving of the Somnus Navy, and five muscled dock workers rolled three large barrels into the kitchen. Rolling those bar large barrels was no easy feat. I waited by surveying the horned fish entrees, rolled with grains and a thin layer of sea leaves. The men situated the barrels and unstopped a hole to pour a glass of deep purple wine. My brother-in-law smacked a barrel. Three barrels of Ormia wine, as requested. Perfect, I said, gesturing to the castle cooks to complete the fish entrees with their herbal sauce. I was able to turn, or I was about to turn away to my next task when Marin's voice caught me. Is it perfect? Marin asked, turning her place away from the dead fish. So much life taken to serve the hunger of guests who may not even come. I heard that you invited the royalty of Ormeo and Hues, but do you truly think they will come? The stress clawed into my stomach, and I whispered back, even if the kings and queens refuse to come, the princesses know how to sneak away from their parents as well as you and I have hope. Leaning away, I said, concerning the fish, there will be stuffed mushrooms for others like you who observe a meatless diet. But what is worse, killing a few extra fish or insulting a guest by miscounting the dinner plates? Marin opened her mouth to answer, but her husband jumped in. You should not ask questions when you know you will dislike the answer. To Marin, he said, come now, is it time to change into that gown you are dying to show me?
My sister blushed and gladly took his arm to escort her to their chambers. I smiled, thinking of her beautiful blue-green blue out with sleeves that draped to the floor. Her transformation between a simple dock lady and extravagant princess always took me by surprise. I glanced over my own gown. The shrews, in all my frantic planning for the event, tattered, described my insides and outsides. My brown, my brown dress was rumpled from my day's activities, including a dusting of flour on my bodice. How did that get there? At least my elbow-length blonde hair remained contained in its morning updo. It usually liked to poke free from the bows like birds fleeing the nest. The sun ho hovered over the horizon. There were a hundred more items to check off, but guests would arrive any moment. Time to make myself look as perfect as the rest of the evening, as if no sweat or tears were shed behind the curtains. I dashed from the kitchens to my bedchamber, passing the ballroom. The servants were still arranging the florals. They were behind schedule. I considered helping, maybe stealing a moment to smell the star tulips, but there was no time to instruct them in the proper hanging of garlands. No time, no time. Maybe I should have helped, or maybe I should have allowed Garnet to help. No, this was my problem, not hers. I would show father that I was capable of difficult and last minute decisions. Still, I prayed to the goddess of time that the sun would sink slower, allowing me more time before guests arrived. I found my two younger sisters, Pearl and Tanzanite, preparing for the celebrations in our shared bed, bed chamber. Pearl was impossibly beautiful for a 15 year old. She had father's midnight black hair and mother's round brown eyes and milky face. On me, I thought the round features made me look overfed. On Pearl, they made her look youthful and innocent. She also had a figure that could wear a potato sack and still turn heads. For all her beauty, however, she was as naive as a fawn. Sorry, if you hear my dog whining. My husband just came home and he wants attention. <laughs> my, my dog, not my husband. <laughs> <clears throat> Sorry. Um, some called her Pearl the younger sister, the light of somnus for her beauty and unsurpassed charity for others. At 12 years old, Tanzanite was my youngest sister and the youngest princess of Regina Valley. My sisters and I called her Tansy. Her blonde hair was striped with black and her dark green eyes had tones of brown in the right lighting. As soon as I entered the room, Tansy jumped from her chair and ran to me. Emmer! She cupped her hands around my ear and whispered, Pearl said something mean to me, so you should look at her and laugh like I said something funny about her. I leaned back, but instead of laughing, I stared in shock. Tansy, how rude! First of all, I had a hard time believing that Pearl said anything mean. Second of all, where did Tansy learn such a trick? Every year, she seemed to grow more and more devious. She pouted at me. Bishrews! Shocked again by her language, I rocked back. At least, I tried to. Tansy stood on my dress, pulling me off balance. An ugly rip tore through my dress and my heart. Everything was supposed to be perfect. The brown blue out gown was the perfect shade to emphasize my green eyes. It was the perfect length to make me look tall and not baggy. It was the perfect fashion of elegance with a high queen's collar and lace sewn around the openings. I had come to my bedchambers hoping to freshen it with a wet rag over the wrinkles and flower dusting. Instead, a rip of 12 centimeters rose from its broken hem. Oh, Tansy said, looking at the accidental alteration. Oh no, was that your evening gown? Her hands went up to her horrified mouth. Forgive me, I am so sorry, can we mend it? Was there time? I had no other gowns ready. Too late to customize another gown. Too late to even shop for something pre-made. Too late, too late. Pearl knelt at my feet to examine the rip. It may be easy to mend. Turning her eyes to mine, she stood and wrapped her arms around me. Everything will be all right, she said. Let it out. Mother says that holding back tears only causes headaches. Was I crying? It was only a rip. Only a rip in my perfect dress on my perfect day with a hundred other things piled on top of me. I hugged Pearl back, allowing myself a few seconds to breathe and pretend that everything was still perfect. No time to pretend. No time to breathe. I squeezed my little sister before stepping back, sniffling and wiping my eyes. I had to be strong. How could I help Garnet from breaking down if I did too? Tansy, I said, will you fetch Elisa to meet me in the weaving room? Tansy nodded and slipped out the door to call on the castle seamstress. I thanked Pearl and sent a prayer to the goddesses that the rest of my plan stayed above the manure trench. A quick scrubbing around or removed the flower and smoothed the wrinkles before I ran down the stone stairs. Midway through the corridor, I spotted an elderly maid with more gray hair than black. Alyssa, I called. 
Did Tansy send you? The seamstress blinked. No, your highness. I haven't seen Princess Tanzanite. Grumbling, I beckoned her to follow me anyway. I showed and explained my ripped dress as we walked to the weaving room. Tansy... Sorry, I heard some noise and thought my dog was getting in trouble. <laughs> Tansy stepped out just as we arrived. Oh, she said, you found her. Alyssa, Emma needs... I already informed her, I said, hurrying past my sister. Thank you, Tansy. Do not worry, she said, stepping away. All is it going according to plan. Her attention lingered on me with a curious expression, and I had no time to speculate. A large loom appropriately took up half of the weaving room. The other half was occupied with washing and drying buckets, filling the room with scents of soap and stagnant water. Our interest was in the corner where the strick of flux sat beside an empty spinning wheel and a cabinet with dozens of drawers that contained buckles, threads, and snippets of lace and fabric. Alyssa began picking up my dress and spinning the <clears throat> pinning the ripped edges together. Will it be done in time? I asked. Yes, she said. As long as there is enough thread on the spinning wheel, could you grab it for me? Of course, I said, reaching for the bobbin of the fresh, freshly crafted thread. When the weather forbade me from visiting the gardens, I often came to the weaving room to watch Alyssa spin at the wheel. She sang songs to keep her spinning rhythm and wrapped her flax with blue ribbon to symbolize her happy marriage. I had watched her remove the bobbin on occasion, but had never tried it myself. How do I take it off? Alyssa spared me less than a glance as she busily picked at the threads of my garment. Loosen it from the maiden. Right. What was the maiden? I grabbed at the bobbin and the parts around it, then pulled. Nothing. I pulled harder until the wood cracked and my hand slipped. I grabbed the next closest part of the spinning wheel for support. My finger caught the top needle top that was usually covered with unspun flax. Pain shot through my index finger, jumped up my arm to my heart, then burst to my head and fabric-laced toes. I fell into a dream, and I dreamed of falling. My hair slipped free from its pins to flutter like tongues of flame around my face. Each wild flutter made me want to cry out. My 16th birthday was supposed to be perfect, with no hairs out of line. The shimmer of my gown dimmed as I fell into nothingness. The force of the fall put me in a fetal position, pushing my lighter legs and arms above me as my back raced towards the ground. At least I assumed there was a ground. All I could see was the tunnel of blackness growing around me as the whole of light shrank to a pinprick, then faded, faded, faded. The darkness swallowed me, yet I continued to fall. A voice echoed from in the darkness. It came from somewhere, from the light or somewhere below. I concentrated on the sound only to recognize my name. Emmer. Only my sisters and close friends called me Emmer. My parents called me Emerald, and everyone else called me Princess Rayo of Somnus. The harder I listened, the more distant it became. The whisper faded to a thought, then to a memory. I fell, but surrounded in darkness, I had no perspective to gauge my speed or distance. All I had was the air rushing around me. Eventually, I managed to twist myself to face the rushing air. I continued to drop into darkness as silver dots appeared below. They grew into spots with the sinister shine. A few of the shining dots grew larger and closer. My heart caught as I realized what they were. They were the points of needles. My pulse quickened. I fell with uncontrollable speed towards the sharp ends of gigantic needles. I wanted to spread my arms to slow my fall, but I also wanted to curl into a ball to hopefully avoid the needles. I struggled to angle myself away from their stabbing tips. Swimming through the air did nothing to change my position. With every second that I fell, more and more dots appeared, more spots with sinister shine. There were too many, too close together. I could not avoid them. The air rushed faster past me as the needles came closer. My heartbeats hammered in my ears. A wicked gleam shone on a dozen needles directly below me. Their deadly tips reached for me like teeth. I saw my reflection in them, then shut my eyes, terrified of the impact. With my eyes squeezed closed, the rushing air around me shifted. It blew from multiple angles and softened. Hey, an unfamiliar masculine voice scoffed. I dared not to move. The needles, too many needles below. I kept my eyes shut in the darkness, tensing for the pain. Hey, girl, the man drawled. You awake? What a disrespectful cad. My eyes snapped open. The needles were gone. Instead of never-ending darkness, I sat on wildflowers beside a dirt pathway, wearing an odd purple chemise that cut below my shoulders and knees. Two men stared down at me from the path. Beyond them, the grassy field dropped to a flat blue horizon. 
The men looked about a year or two older than I was. Their long-sleeved tunics, if I could call them such, cropped at their waists and were made of some glossy material. Their heavy boots were likewise made of strange leathers and appeared new and sturdy, despite the amount of mud crusted their th crusting their thick soles. The packs on their backs were also strange. They had a strap for each arm, rested on their shoulders, and had a variety of outside pockets, one containing an odd tubular water skin. One man stood closer to me and captivated my attention. His face was sculpted as if by the goddess of mankind, perfectly chiseled and smooth, ink black hair swept along his youthful hairline, and a trimmed beard defined his angular jaw. His eyes were the lightest of blues, like a cloudless day. Staring up at him was like staring at the sun. So he's alive, he said. His baritone voice was warm, and he slurred his words. He was the, dis the disrespectful cat. A corner of his mouth lifted into a devilishly attractive smirk, while his eyebrow on the opposite side arched high. He straightened and pulled back a long stick. Had he been about to prod me with that? The nerve of him! Before I could accuse him of disrespecting his royal highness and warn him of with charges, he turned away to speak with his companion. Do you think anyone's searching for her? The second man leafed through a booklet. His handsomeness played less with chiseled angles and more with gentleness. He had youthful wide eyes and round cheeks despite his muscled figure. His dark hair and was had prematurely receded a couple centimeters, and his nose had probably seen better days. His small mouth puckered as he concentrated on, pa on the pages. She's probably just lost, Caden. Can't blame her, considering these trails. Or drunk. Excuse me? I asked the chiseled Caden. I am not intoxicated. Shuffling to my feet, my little wobble argued my declaration. Both men stared at me, a little surprised. Caden failed to retain his doubtful smirk. Oh, yeah? He asked. What's your name? I frowned. Are you so lowly that you have never seen depictions of the royal family? The two men raised their eyebrows. Royal? The second man asked. I huffed. I am Princess Emerald, third eldest of Queen Rayo, daughter of His Royal Highness, King of Somnus. The two men shared a quick, wide-eyed glance, then Caden burst into laughter. He became less and less handsome with each insult. Well, welcome to England. He laughed and dropped into a mocking bow. Now come on, we'll take you back to town. I'm sure they have some sobering drinks for you at the pub. I am not drunk, I snapped. Oh, yeah? He challenged. Then what's your real name, and where are you? My name is Prince, uh, Princess Emerald Rayo, and I am... I looked around myself. Where in Somnus was a well-worn dirt path between sheep fields and a sudden drop to... Was that water crashing on the rocks below? Never before had I seen so much that it stretched to the horizon and curved beyond sight. Considering this men's strange slang and slight blending of words, they reminded me of the Aldrins from beyond the valley. A roar in the sky took my attention to a strange white bird that flew high in the air without flapping its long wings or fish-like tail. Where was I? I stumbled as my vision tilted. Whoa there, Caden caught me by my hand and round my back. Do not touch me, I commanded, taking a step for balance. Not only was it inappropriate, but also wildly confusing as his muscle arms offered no support or Sorry, I need to swallow. <laughs> Support or warmth against me. I felt nothing. Nothing felt right. His hands snapped away. Pardon, we only mean to help. Your help is unnecessary, I said automatically. The handsome devil shrugged off his worries and spoke to his companion. Come on, Micah, she probably doesn't need, your, need our help. And do you believe her? Or, oh, sorry, she says she doesn't need our help. And do you believe her? Micah asked. Miss, you're unsteady. Let us help you into town. Before I could repeat my independence, Caden Scott, so she can scam us? The prettier they are, the bigger the scam. By the looks of her, she'll be we'll be asking for alms when we're done with when she's done with us. Excuse Caden, Mike chided his deviously handsome friend. This isn't Paris. She obviously needs help. Caden rolled his eyes, but did nothing more to persuade his friend one way or the other. Micah took careful steps towards me as if I was some feral animal. Look, he said, with slow enunciation, we're only trying to help. Let's get you back to town. Surely I could make my own way down this path, but what town was it? I had no idea where I was or how I arrived there. As little as I desired their aid, I momentarily depended on their knowledge. Hoping not to sound like a lunatic, I carefully worded my question. Where would you take me? 
Caden gestured with a nod up the path. Bowcastle. I knew all the towns in Somnus. None were named Bowcastle. Another confirmation that I was outside my father's kingdom, as if the vast expanse of water and lack of mountains on every side said otherwise. How did I come here? Had I traveled thousands of kilometers while unconscious? A worrisome thought returned as Caden offered me offered to help me stand. Do not touch me, I said again. While, or why had I not felt him when he caught me? Why could I not feel the warmth of the sun or the strong breeze that bent the long wild grass? Why did I only feel the concept of what it should have felt like and wool blankets? The whole world passed through me as though a dream. Goddess is above, I was still dreaming. My vision tilted again as I struggled with the truths I knew. This was a dream, yet it seemed as real as life. The details of every salty wave, every fresh blade of grass, the dimples in Michael, Micah's cheeks, and the crispness of Caden's laugh went beyond any dream I ever had, but I felt nothing. Caden, or sorry, Micah frowned. Miss, if you don't mind me asking, were you robbed? Do, what do you remember before we found you? I remembered falling in darkness, rushing towards a thousand needles. I shuddered. <clears throat> Micah muttered to Caden, we can't leave her like this. She's traumatized. What do you expect? Whoa! I collapsed to the ground, losing consciousness in a, within a dream. And that's chapter one. And we met Caden and Micah, uh -huh. who... I guess they got they were looking for adventure and they found her. So I um it sounds like they found more adventure than they were bargaining for. <laughs> yes, they definitely did. <laughs> and they don't seem happy about it. So. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> She's got her work cut out for her to turn them into allies. <laughs> yes. Um and I get I'm realizing I never actually read like the back cover blurb to actually oh, God, God, yeah. introduce the story that um Yeah, we kind of came at it from a different different angle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, England. <laughs> um, yeah, so every princess does or has this uh, gains a kind of concept or really actually loses a sense and that helps make them aware that they are dreaming. So Princess or um, Emmer loses her sense of touch. She has hypoesthesia. Um, which was a lot of fun to research. <laughs> what is so is so hyper so hyper anesthesia, and that's where you can't feel anything. Yes, it's um, for her. It's she feels wool. So anything, anytime she picks something up, she feels like she's holding wool, and because she is sleeping in a wool with her wool blankets on a wool bed, and so that's all that she feels. And that's how she knows she is asleep. And um, if you read the back cover blurb, it slowly turns into a numbness, which is um, similar, or which is also a symptom of hypoesthesia that um, you just, you don't feel pain. You don't feel, um, you know, your nerves and um, it becomes a real problem. <laughs> Her. Like that can be hard to like walk around and stuff because you need uh -huh. some of that sensation to be able to feel yep. the ground under your feet to, yep. to feel uh <laughs> changes in terrain my um i have some close family members who suffered from neuropathy which is oh. sort of similar where you start losing feeling in your feet and mm -hmm. they had a lot of difficulty getting around and and operating anything with your feet mm -hmm. it sounds like she had the whole body they, they just mm -hmm. had like a specific <laughs> the feet <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I kind of used my research a little or on that, sorry, <clears throat> um, to help cause some of or create some of the tension of like, oh, she needs to wake up and, you know, and try to fix this and, you know, to recognize, yes, she is, she is dreaming because otherwise it's our world and mm. everything looks very real. So, um, to be able to distinguish or and help her recognize this isn't exactly where she's supposed to be. Um, so, so there's so five can't. senses and 12 princesses. So yes. how are you going to so, handle each of them losing a sense? I guess you're going to have to du duplicate after a while. Um, so I also included some of uh, some losses that people um, experience while dreaming. So loss of memory, loss of, um, 
inhibitions, loss of teeth. <laughs> teeth? Uh, yes. So you, we actually get the loss of teeth in book two. Um, and so. <laughs> what about reading? I remember I was watching some cartoons yes. when I was a kid and they say you can't read things in dreams. It's all gibberish. Unless you are actually uh, readers and writers. So a very avid readers and writers gen actually can read. Um, like I've actually been able to read in my dreams. It's just not common. I have to try that. I've, I, there yeah. just aren't any books in the dreams. Yeah. <laughs> it's more the characters like, hey, you know, yeah. I didn't appreciate what you did in chapter 10. <laughs> we need to go back and change it because I, I think it should have been this way. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's just like signposts or, you know, just simple things. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a common thing. Uh, they a lot of things it is that people think it's impossible um but then again some people think you you know there's no color and you know some people dream without color they just dream oh, no. in black and I, white i have vivid color <laughs> I, I also do but apparently and my sound. mom dreams in black and white and i have no idea why or whatever so i don't know well there's, there's that's there's also, also a thing that people yeah, and, and color in their dreams so that's another fun thing that one and some people don't have inner monologues either which i found <laughs> it is interesting it was like you don't have a voice in your head when you're doing anything nattering at you <laughs> yeah uh, um yeah I, I well and again I, I think i mentioned earlier i i've always had a fascination with dreams i've kept a dream journal for many years and um actually allowed some of my dreams to inspire small tidbits and parts of these books because they're dreaming and so what, you know, if they're dreaming, what better inspiration is there than actual dreams? <laughs> and so where does Prince Charming come into this? <laughs> is he in the dream? He's outside of it. I guess since it's, it's first person narrative, like we don't know what's going on outside <laughs> of uh, the dream back in her world in Sumnus. Yes. Sumnus? Sumnus, yeah. Sumnus. Yeah. So um, that was another reason I wanted to explore her dreams because I wanted to explore because in all the other versions other than disney of well and modern versions the prince is a stranger because it's somebody you know hundreds of years later comes by and wakes her up and so i wanted her to meet her prince and get to know him and fall in love with him in her dream so that when she wakes up and he's there it's not oh hi you just, you know, lip raped me. <laughs> Hello, stranger. Thanks for waking me up. Now, yes. bye bye. <laughs> There's a door. Don't let it hit you on the way out. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, 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 so is so either Caden or Micah is, or maybe both. Maybe this is our age. Uh, what is it? Uh, reverse harem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, with us too, it's called a love triangle. <laughs> I, think well, it's I know. No, it's an angle. Unless Micah and Caden like each other, then it's a, tri a full triangle. Requires <laughs> everybody yeah. to <laughs> like everybody. But if it's two guys and one girl, and they both like the girl, and they're not interested in each other, it's a love angle. <laughs> yeah, I guess you have to be like Twelfth Night with cross dressing or whatever. Or yeah, have um, some fun LGBTQ stuffs in there to get a true love triangle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I remember I was on like some author Facebook thing, and someone went a whole explanation and I was like all right so you got the love angle <laughs> mm. I have a whole theory about the love triangle and that spoils all love triangles in every every story pretty much unless the author just really messes things up or well just messes up with me I'm just like oh, no we're supposed to do it this way <laughs> uh, yeah uh, I, I could tell it to you but then it might spoil every every love triangle you ever read <laughs> i mean i mostly read like action books so yeah. I mean, there generally isn't a love triangle in there. there's generally not any romance at all really <laughs> um there i mean there could be some hanky panky but like, I mean, like you know like it's more of the it's like the plot yeah no and like it, it's more of like the like hey we just survived the thing 
Yeah. How about it? Like it's just, they're not looking for a relationship. They're like in they have bigger goals, and if they fall into bed with people, they're they're falling into bed with them just for fun and not for anything else. Okay, that's, we're gonna die in a couple hours. Want to make them worth it? <laughs> I mean, that's that's mostly what it is. Oh wow, we actually survived. Uh, maybe yeah. that making it worth it thing. Maybe maybe we need to repeat that. Maybe there's some good good luck there. <laughs> Like stuff like that. Like, like they're not looking for a relationship. If they find one by accident, it's like winning the lottery. Oh. <laughs> they're, they're not exactly falling into bed with people who are like relationship material on either side of the fence. Oh. <laughs> so. Oh. So you don't really want the relationship to work out. <laughs> I mean, a lot of these, I'm like, I really hope it doesn't. Oh. And some of them, like, it's it's cool. Like, uh, like some of the like, it it, it it some of them they do event. It does eventually work out because they're showing you how it works in those society. Those, mm -hmm. fantasy, you know, it, some of them have such, such interesting stories and interesting jobs. And then at some point, they're also like, well, I wonder what it would. How would a relationship between them actually work? Yeah. You're falling out of bed with each other, like what if they decide to make this a thing how would that work with the politics and the whatever and that could be really fun because like this was never supposed to work and mm -hmm. you know now it's like well now we actually want it to work so how, how do we go about th that can become sort of wild too <laughs> yeah so that's actually the fun that i came or well with my haunted romance um trilogy i set out to write a horror and i ended up writing a romance <laughs> <laughs> and your character was like, "Yeah, we're not feeling horror." Like, well, let's just, no, she's let's just exactly change the story thing. and see if it's she notices. <laughs> just, um, yeah, I had only like two scenes that were really truly horror, and then, the, but the book as a whole is mostly romance or romantic, at least plot-wise. But it is very, um, it's a different series, a completely. Um, different but then book two is very much um we've got a lord and a commoner uh, who doesn't even have a family and <laughs> like and then, how's this gonna work his family is not going to accept her <laughs> well you know you could have a mistress <laughs> <laughs> well yeah so book two was and, very and much his family that. and that's have to approve. Where fairy tale retellings are where i started exploring fairy tale retellings because um they his homeland is literally the land of Grimm's fairy tales. And so I had a lot of fun, yeah, retelling Grimm, a couple different Grimm's, free, Grimm's fairy tales for that story. And that was what helped inspire this entire trilogy or this entire series yeah. of Dreaming Princesses. Which book um, was that that inspired it? So let's see if I can grab them. Ooh. Oh, I'm having books fall on me. Uh oh, <laughs> there's no workman's comp for this. <laughs> yes, there's no hazard pay. We we don't. The podcast doesn't have a fund for that. We, we would need we would need actual like paying supporters, and then we could have like the author injured in the in the uh, interview fund. Yeah, apparently, my my office is or my uh, yeah where I'm doing this interview is not OSHA approved. Um, uh oh. <laughs> Uh, so um, that's my Don't Date the Haunted um, trilogy. So the first book is Don't Date the Haunted, and it's all about a, a character from the land of horror, and she knows all the rules to survive in horror. And then she goes to the land of romance, where she is totally culture shocked because girls are suddenly screaming in excitement about a masquerade and want men to chase them. <laughs> So, uh, and then she also meets a lord from fantasy, and there's a detective from mystery who's investigating the haunting death of her ex fiance. So, it is a literal genre mashup. And um, then in book two, um, Don't Marry the Cursed, uh, they go to the land of fantasy, specifically Grimm's fairy tale fantasies, where all fairy tales um, take place. And um, I actually did base a little bit, uh, you probably can't see it. Um, so basically, they went to like Germany to was it the Black Forest? <laughs> so now we're all the well, Grimm's parents. They get to go through some <laughs> <laughs> and yes, it's um, it, it, it is named Margin, which is um, uh, Marchen is German for fairy tale or the fairy tale genre or stories, and so um, 
or uh, yeah. So it is very German <laughs> based, and but that's my haunted romance tr or yeah series, which I'm, I just have a lot of fun with it. I, I've realized with those so books. So there's only two in that series? It was a trilogy. I just didn't grab book three because I was already having books fall on me. Oh, um, well, well, what's the title of the third one and what, what's the, the quick premise on it? Since we yeah, got the other don't they answer death. They go back to horror. And so the main character from book one, she knows what's going on, but the people that she's bringing with her with oh, magical no. abilities yeah. are going to horror and now they look like witches. <laughs> And who need to be hunted and killed. So, um, yes, I had. A, I, I realized if I don't have fun with it, I can't write it. It needs to make me I, laugh. I, I need agree. to just. I, I need to have fun with it, or I can't write it. I tried writing a philosophical, deep, you know, story about like a almost Christian, t you know, retelling and. I couldn't get into it. I, I love the concept of it, but I, I can't write it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's an interesting concept. It's just not for you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so, yeah, uh, but with my dreaming princesses, I have a lot of fun with the culture clashes of looking at our world with different perspectives and also, um, her world coming back to her world. Um, this is still book one, so it's not too much spoilers of, because I, I told you in the beginning, Disney only told half the story. I wanted to tell the whole story of Sleeping Beauty. Um, going back to her world, um, it's been a hundred years. A lot has changed. The whole monarchy er, uh, has completely been uprooted and is a completely different um, setting than what she's used to. Um, I had a lot yeah. of yeah. What happened to her sisters? Did they all and... live and die. <laughs> well, they're all sleeping, in you know oh. various yes. So yeah, all of them are poisoned or um, so. Book yeah, Snow White or Princess and the Frog. She's sleeping with a frog, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so that's why they're married because. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted it to be clean. <laughs> so, <laughs> Eight-year-old approved. Yes. It's okay and, if she she's with a frog if she's married to it. <laughs> and then book three that I will be releasing um, hopefully next month, or at least this fall. So in no October or November, I'm aiming for October, um, will be um, a Little Red Riding Hood. So when she is gobbled up by the wolf um, in that time period before she, she's in there for hundred years. <laughs> so she can hang out with Emmer. When, are they all going to be asleep or poisoned for a hundred years? <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yep. The world, they all wake up. The world's completely changed and things are going on uh, even in the Northern kingdoms that. Um, but wait, yeah. wait, what does that do to you to be inside a wolf for a hundred years? Does that <laughs> So I did actually rewrite it a little bit that um, she um, is not in the wolf's stomach. She convinces herself to try to, um, or she, that's the story that she tells herself to try to make sense of the traumatic incident of um, being attacked by um, a grandma, you know, <laughs> because that's what the, you know, wolf looks it's like. Dressed and disguised to be like, and but wasn't the original like Red Riding and the Wolf? So like, it wasn't it like a morality thing to keep? They were afraid that girls were like going to go out and like do things with the fellows, and the fellows are the wolves. <laughs> that is a common um, interpretation, um, and it depends on the version of the Little Red Riding Hood whether Little Red Riding Hood was an innocent little girl or whether she kicks his butt. And so <laughs> it depends on which version you're using. Um, and yeah, that is a common interpretation. I, they actually talk a lot about it for any listeners who are curious in the classic fairy tales by um, Maria, Maria Tartar. She goes on about it of uh, just the different versions and how 
there are almost two different stories of Little Red Riding Hood because mm. they're so, or just the character of who she is um, completely changes the story. <laughs> yeah. And, and the attack can yes. be yes. mean different things depending on where we're going with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. And um, then the other one is um, Princess and the Pea, which are in book three. <clears throat> So it's Little Red Riding Hood, and then another one is Princess and the Pea. So it's um, two princesses per book. She is obviously asleep on the stack of mattresses with the pea that is really bothering her. So, yeah. So, it sounds like she got off easy. She didn't have to prick anything. She's just got the oh, pea on the mattress. So oh. is there two princesses per <laughs> book? Um, after book one, yes. There are two princesses per book because there are 12 total, and I am a very concise storyteller so um in order to make the books actually novel length i had to include the other princesses stories plus what emmer is doing um to try to find them and wake them up um oh. so it's kind of three stories rolled in um as yeah you get two fairy tale retellings plus emmer's adventures continued as she yeah, explores her new or the changes in her own world and um, yeah, tries to find her sisters to wake them up. So, so yeah. how many books are you planning in total for the series? Six. Yeah. You're going to squash all 12 stories into six books? Because <laughs> like, if yeah. book one is one princess and every book after that is two. Yes. Well, I am not mathing. Because <laughs> yes, because one of the princesses um, is actually the villain who put them all asleep. So she won't get a fairy tale retelling she is the villain. And to avoid spoilers, I'm not going to say who she is. Um, <laughs> you find is, out is, book one. Is she going to be a mismatch of like the villains from other fairy tales? <laughs> yes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> now I'm, I'm curious. Not to get the mishmash or mix mix mash of uh the grandma or the old woman of um snow white who gives the apple to snow white and the grandma of um uh little red riding hood and so that's her disguise she is the old woman and um <laughs> and then of course she also has other fun sneaky things up her lady sleeves yeah so, so we'll monster. find out why she put them to sleep for 100 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. <laughs> and what did she do in the hundred years that they were asleep? Because she obviously didn't send herself to sleep. Because the whole Try. point was she to get rid of the them. World, Pinky. <laughs> <laughs> did she succeed? <laughs> You'll have to read to find out. <laughs> well, and in what ways? There are many ways to take over the world, but then what does the world look like afterwards, or after it's been conquered? And so, yes. And, how, and what is she going to do when they start waking up? Because she. They're going to eventually figure it out, you know? Well, and that's when the Huntsman comes into play. <laughs> so, yes, it's... I have all six of them kind of outlined and planned, um, or at least, yeah, kind of a timeline figured out, and I know which princess is going to be which tale um, and which what their magical powers are going to be because they will all gain a kind of magical power that is um, also based from... I use the biblical description of the creation of the world. So Emmer does gain a power or magical power of influencing plants. And mm -hmm. so she doesn't just make them grow, but she can make them shrink and change colors. She has, you know, complete influence of these plants that she can, um, that's her magical power. And then each princess will gain a magical power as they are dreaming. And that is another key of, Hey, I'm dreaming. This is not normal. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. But that power comes back with them when they wake uh -huh. up. Yes, they keep their That's power. Cool. That's a little spoiler, but yes, they keep their powers <laughs> when they wake up. And um, so they are all gaining not just experiences, but um, some knowledge, or, you know, knowledge on modern things. And, you know, Emmer has a, it gets a fascination with phones. Her sister gets a fascination with modern boats. Um, another one of her sisters gets a fascination with cameras and they're, you know, with this knowledge of these things can exist and with their own magical powers, they, you know, are able to kind of bring some elements of our world into their own to 
create some fun things. <laughs> That's cool. So yeah, it's, it's a lot of um, culture shocks and paradigm shifts in the beginning of just like melding of worlds or I guess of clashing of worlds in the beginning and then kind of as the story progresses becomes more melding of worlds um especially with the characters <laughs> that's pretty that's this is such a fun series mm -hmm. I'm having fun with it yes <laughs> no it sounds like it like mm -hmm. this this has been such a fun interview <laughs> oh yay <laughs> I, I learned a lot too. I didn't know that there were so many versions of the different fairy tales and how wildly different they could be. Mm -hmm. This is very cool. <laughs> I, it's been like, I, I had like the, like I knew about Grimm mm -hmm. and I knew about uh, with the mermaid, there was the, the guy. Oh, Hans Charles uh, Anderson. Hans Christian Hans. Hans That's Christian. all I knew. And then I knew the Disney he versions. Torture his characters. So <laughs> he had quite. I mean, if you look at his life, he wasn't exactly a happy, well adjusted yeah. person in, in loving relationships. Like, he was not writing from a place, a good place. So, like, I think he was kind of tortured himself. Yeah. So he was just kind of reflecting back in the fairy tales he wrote what he his what he was seeing and experiencing. Yes. Well, and it's a lot of the fairy tales is just I mean, Grimm's especially all they were doing was collecting stories and putting them together, writing them down. Um they were folklorists, really. And they just wrote it down. They collected stories simply that were being told. Um and wrote them down and distributed them. They didn't make these stories. They they didn't come up with them. They might they tweaked them, um, especially Charles Perrault and um, Hans Christian Andersen. But um, the Grimm's brothers, they were um, much more true to the tales that were being told to them. But of oh, course, okay. with every telling, you know, depending on it's like the game of telephone. With every person who tells it, the story changes a little. And so even with Grimm's, it is still, you know, them telling the story of their own. So um, if, if they heard multiple versions, I guess they had to try and figure out what's the, the core version. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, um, again, Princess and the Frog, it's so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see, I'm trying to remember exactly how it was of um, one of the popular or so the popular tale is one of the older versions that we have record of it and um i'm now trying to look up exactly how it, how it was phrased because um, it's ah, hello okay <laughs> um yeah because there are actually two i actually have so in the two books that i showed you both of them have a version of princess and the frog and they end differently from Grimm's. So they both have Grimm's fair, or Princess and the Frog, but they have two different endings. One of them is one where she um, slams him against the wall, is trying to kill him, and that's how he wakes up, or turns into a prince, <laughs> saying, now you'll get your sleep, and she throws him against the wall instead of sleeping with him for three days. Um, <laughs> And that's one way to do it. Yes, but because it's Grimm's and they told they republished their books multiple times, both stories are actually accurate, um, which yeah, is fascinating to me. And um, the tale of the world or the tale of the well of the world's end was in, um, wasn't written down until I found my notes until Robert Chambers set down as much of it as he could. After hearing it from Charles Kirkpatrick Sharp, who heard it from his nurse around 1784. So it is literally a game of telephone for these fairy tales, which is why we have so many different versions and why we can have so much fun with retelling them. So. No, I, the, the, we, I mean, look, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half having fun with it. <laughs> and it's, it sounds like there's even, 
there's it sounds like there's even more fun to be had i just i'm just <laughs> marveling at like how many versions and oh. and and how we ended up with them at all like like what were the original versions even like if with the, after that game of telephone they were just telling us about like i like they could have been very different <laughs> <laughs> yes yes they were very different <laughs> and and that's one reason why I'm, like it I love Disney. I, you know, I love what he's done or what the Disney productions have done to the fairy tales and that they are, you know, making some of the um, tales more appropriate to our day and age, especially Frozen. Oh my goodness, that was a messed up tale. And so, <laughs> it's also more accessible too. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. Um, it, the only irritation I get from it is when people think that was the original version <laughs> this story. I'm like, no, no, Disney did not come up with this. <laughs> they came up with their version. <laughs> and, you know, and I don't try to, with my, my tales, I'm not trying to claim that I'm the creator of these the first times at all. No, it's, I am very much trying to just bring to light other versions so that, yeah. And yeah. Do you have notes that there are, notes huh? Do you have notes in the back of the book that talk about sort of the history of these things or how you got into it? Like, if you don't, you should. This is really fascinating. <laughs> We've had a really fascinating discussion about this. <laughs> I do mention a little bit in my acknowledgments um, of just like my the big acknowledgments of Dreaming Beauty starts with, I'd like to start by thanking Charles Perrault for record recording my favorite version of Sleeping Beauty, except this one, of course. And, <laughs> of course. and yeah, so I do talk a little bit about it on um, in my acknowledgments page, but I do also make posts on my, my website of um my inspiration saying here are the different versions these are some just summaries of the different versions and um so i have a couple posts of like you know saying not disney's sleeping beauty and not disney's princess and the frog those are two of my posts where i really explore the different versions and how they individually inspired me to make the stories that i did or to yeah pick apart and create the stories that i did so Yes, I, not in the book specifically, just a snippet of them. But I go into deep, or I go into depth um, on my or on my website. And we and we have that linked in the show notes or the description, depending on where you're watching or listening. Yes. So definitely check that out because this this I don't know about you guys, but I'm fascinated. <laughs> yes. This has been a riveting discussion <laughs> for me. Oh my. <laughs> <laughs> it is always fun. You know, I, I love talking with other authors because we all research such different topics and we all come up or we all, you know, we're all little experts in our own little areas and there's so much to learn from each other. So I've really appreciated this opportunity to talk with you. And, and yeah, <laughs> this, this was <laughs> so fun. Bit more about what you do and your stories and your experiences in England and <laughs> like, We've got to talk another time just about England. <laughs> oh, sure, definitely. Um, and you definitely got to come back with with it so we can keep talking about these princesses and these. This is this is a fun, fascinating conversation. So we we definitely want to revisit it with with, with you know another princess with another story because this is this is really I, I'm. I'm having a lot of fun. Oh, <laughs> I don't want you to yes. leave, but I understand. I want to be sensitive to your time. And, <laughs> and yours. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much for making You're this welcome. time for me. And it has been, yeah, a lot of fun. <laughs> no, this has been fantastic. Is there anything else that you want to say about the Dreaming Princesses or Dreaming uh, Dreaming Beauty? So we've uh -huh. talked about a lot of things or the haunting romances or like <laughs> any of the things that we have talked about. <laughs> Uh, I, I do feel like I've talked a, about a lot of it. So I, I like I did make notes of things, specific things I wanted to be sure I actually mentioned. And did we hit them? <laughs> we did hit them. Yes. So thank you. Um, and yeah, just they can be found on Amazon, and um, the Dreaming Princesses series is available on Kindle Unlimited. Um, my Haunted Romance trilogy is also or is available um, on other avenues like uh, iBooks and Kobo and Google Play or Google Play and those things so yeah it's 
it's a lot of fun. I'm going to be, I guess, um, I'm actually attending a book club later tonight with who they will be discussing Dreaming Beauty because oh. of my local bookstore. <laughs> Without me prompting anything, they just decided to use my book for their YA book club. And I was incredibly honored and asked if I could crash the book club meeting. <laughs> that's said, so Please. cool. So that's later tonight that I will be having fun with. Um, but then um, my next big event that I'll be doing is Fan X in Salt Lake City. And so if you're in that area, I'd love to see anybody who listened to the podcast and had questions. <laughs> this will definitely be up. In, it'll be up tonight. So uh, oh, okay. this should be there's plenty of time for y'all to listen. And, and do, <laughs> I don't know when Fan X is. I think it's it's, in, it's uh, Bilbo and Frodo's birthday. So September 22nd. Ah, first. plenty of time for people yeah. to have listened. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so thank, thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you and for having me. <laughs> you're welcome. And this has been C Ray Dark, and I am Linda Cusera. We've been talking about Dreaming Beauty, the first book in the Dreaming Princess in a series. We've also talked about the, the some haunting romances that had some really fun titles. I don't remember them all. <laughs> <laughs> one of them but yeah 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 so uh and this has just been like fantastic like oh, thank you okay. thank you this has just been awesome so i oh. hope everybody enjoyed and you know have a great day or great night wherever you are and we're gonna get c ray dark back because this was too much fun we are going to get you back we're gonna talk do an episode about this the haunt the the mashup of genres because now i'm in i'm like very curious to talk more about this and we'll have you back to talk about some more of the dreaming princesses so <laughs> All right, just, I look forward just, to it. <laughs> this has been so much fun. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thanks. That's going to do it. That'll be another episode of Fantasy Lore and More, and we'll have another fantasy author another day, and then we'll talk about another fantasy book. So until then, have a good one.